Okay, welcome, uh, Jack Wilmore. Uh, it's nice of you to come. And uh, what we wanted to start out with just a little bit about your background, your educational background, uh, where you went to college, and how you got into this field. And then after that, uh, when your career started to intersect with the American College of Sports Medicine and how that has gone in, in your career. Okay, great. Well, I was uh, born and raised in Southern California, and uh, my first year went to Colorado State University in engineering. And uh, ha I was paying my own way through school, and the out-of-state tuition killed me. So I, see, I yeah. moved yeah. back to uh, Southern California and went to UC Santa Barbara, University of California at Santa Barbara. And that was a wonderful opportunity. After two quarters of engineering and, and not being able to figure out three-dimensional mechanical uh, drawings, I, I uh, assumed that maybe that wasn't my uh, forte. So I switched over to physical education. I had a wonderful coach and physical education teacher in high school that was such a role model for me, mm -hmm. Mr. Gordon Gray. And even up to the time of his death, he would call and encourage me, always being checking in and, and seeing nice. what, uh, you know, what I was doing and what he could do to help and all. And he was also a graduate of UC Santa Barbara and was very encouraging me for, to, get, to get into that program because my goal then at that point, rather than being an engineer, was to go into uh, the high school level and be a coach mm -hmm. and a physical education That's what teacher. I wanted to do too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that worked yeah. out great because at that time UC Santa Barbara was one of a very small number of institutions throughout the United States that had a, a strong science base to the program. Uh, we were very fortunate to have people like Dr. Ernie Michael and Dr. Rene uh, Rochelle that uh, had tr trained under Dr. Curitan and oh, okay. uh, all the other great professors, Dr. Johnson and so forth at the University of Illinois. And so we were exposed to a very rigorous curriculum. In fact, in my class, uh, my class was very small, but it included Bill Haskell. In fact, Bill Haskell and his wife Wendy and, and mm -hmm. my wife Dottie and I uh, used to double date uh, back when we were in uh, our, our senior year of uh, college. Mm -hmm. And Judy Smith, uh, who went, to, went into neurobiology, uh, is now, I believe, provost at UCLA. So oh, out of darn. just a, maybe a class of 15 to 20 people, uh, three that immediately were, uh, because of the strong science component of the program, were able to really get a good education and be challenged uh, to, to do well. What years were that, uh, you there, Jack, at, at Santa Barbara? UC Santa Barbara, uh, I, I graduated from high school in 1956, and so it was 56, 57 at, uh, it was oh, Colorado A&M yeah. University, yeah. which yeah. Tra changed to, or uh, Colorado A&M to Colorado State University, and then UC Santa Barbara from 1957 through 1960, and then uh, stayed on. Uh, in the state of California, it's great because you go four years and get an academic degree, and then you have to go another year for your teaching credential. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. They also gave you the option of going two years and getting the teaching credential and master's degree. And I did that, and it was great because I was doing student teaching in the high school in the afternoons, and I was doing I was serving as a TA in the mornings at the university. Perfect. Yeah. And it <laughs> immediately I saw a vast difference in the interest level of students, and I yeah. thought, the university <laughs> level is where I'm going to go. Yeah. So I, uh, all of a sudden now, rather than uh, teaching and coaching at the high school level, I made the decision at that time that I wanted to try to get enough education where I could stay at the university level. So I uh, completed my master's degree uh, in 1962. Uh, Dr. Stephen Horvath was my advisor. They had just brought him in. Uh, when I began the master's program and I had a chance to help him mm -hmm. in the development of his lab and that later turned into the Institute of Environmental Stress at UC mm -hmm. Santa Barbara. So I was his first graduate student at UC Santa Barbara. Was uh, Barbara Drinkwater there then? Uh, Barbara or? Drinkwater was on the faculty and I believe she was more in the area of activities and she basically got involved in the lab and got very interested in the physiology okay. and she grew tremendously in terms of her knowledge and her interest and mm -hmm. now I mean she is uh, just the world's expert uh, in yeah. women and bone and actually in many other fields. She was mm -hmm. doing a lot of work with environmental physiology at that time. Okay and um, where did you go next? Well, after I finished there uh, my goal was to, I, I, in some ways I got sort of uh, discouraged by being there because Dr. Horvath was so bright and I felt so dumb 
that I decided I was going to get my doctorate at the University of Oregon, it was going to be an EDD, and it was going to be in administration. Mm -hmm. Why I decided that, I don't know. But after I was there two quarters at the University of Oregon, people were coming to me with all the physiology questions, and I seemed to know the answers. It was just really strange, including mm. uh, the faculty. And I was then teaching the graduate level uh, lab course, and I thought, gosh, maybe I know more than I think I do. So mm -hmm. I, I sort of said, I'm going to go to the switch over to the PhD program and uh, stay in the field of exercise physiology. And that was a very, very wise decision. I got great support from Dr. Peter, Peter Sigerseth, who was my advisor, and Dr. Harrison Clark that was there, oh, H. Harrison yeah, Clark. Sure. Yeah. And that was a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. From there, uh, I went out and, and I was supposed to go back to UC Santa Barbara. They had a job lined up for me. That fell through. So at the last minute, I took uh, uh, my wife and my little daughter and we headed to New York to Ithaca College where I stayed for one year. Position opened at UC Berkeley and I was back in a heartbeat to be able to get back in the University of California oh, system. Yeah. And that was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And it was about that time when uh, I found out, it was actually when I was at Ithaca College, I found out about ACSM, went to a regional meeting uh, at, in Amherst at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, I, that's where I met my lifelong friend, Dave Costell. I'll be there. And uh, it was... Uh, and he was at Cortland. He was or, at Cortland yeah. State. And I was at Ithaca College, and they were just a few miles yeah. apart. We met there and have become lifelong friends. And so that was really nice. But I found out about the ACSM through that regional meeting, went to the national meeting, and it was so small that when the meeting was over, we all went over to Bill Redden's house uh, that uh, evening and either had a beer or a glass of uh, wine or mm -hmm. uh, Coke or whatever. Mm -hmm. Everybody fit into his house, and <laughs> it was a very small, intimate group. Yeah. But what a wonderful uh, opportunity. What so year was that, Jack? That Remember? would have been 1966-67. Uh, so that would have been the New England Regional New uh, England chapter. Regional Chapter meeting was probably 65 or 66, and then the National Meeting uh, just uh, shortly thereafter. Okay, okay. So. Was um, uh, Ben Ritchie involved then? Ben Ritchie. In was there. That's right. Plus Karpovich would have been close there, I in, guess. In fact, on our way home, back to Ithaca, uh, Dr. Cy Morgan, who was the dean of the college there at Ithaca College, uh, took us by Dr. Karpovich's home, and I got to meet both Dr. Karpovich and also Dr. Rathbone. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was exciting for me because as an undergraduate student, I had used both of their, their textbooks. Books, yeah. And uh, yeah. so it was exciting for me to have that opportunity to meet them. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was an excellent meeting, and that really got me started. And it was, uh, from that point on, it was great because there was just so many opportunities to get involved with ACSM and at all levels presenting getting involved uh, with the board and mm -hmm. then being on committees and, and so forth. It was, uh, it was very, very uh, a worthwhile experience to mm -hmm. be able to do that. And where, um, I forgot, I lost track of where you went after you were, you went back to California at, at Berkeley. Right, was at Berkeley at for roughly five years. And uh, what I did is, um, Bill Haskell and I uh, had, had done a lot together as undergraduates and had kept in close contact. Mm -hmm. And Bill was uh, involved in setting up a preventive medicine center at Stanford. And so I took a leave from the University of California uh, for uh, that one year and went over to Stanford and helped Bill and a group of physicians start the preventive medicine center. That uh, later was a, uh, basically uh, assumed uh, by uh, Stanford University as part of their preventive medicine I program. Mm -hmm. And after about six months there uh, of no teaching, I thought, you know, this is fun. I'm enjoying it, and it's been great setting up the programs and all. It was a wonderful opportunity, but I uh, was going to go back into teaching. I was heading back to, to uh, UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. and Dean Ryan at the University of California Davis contacted me and said, We'd really like to have you come up here or think about coming up here. The advantage of going there was that there was a medical school oh, there. Yeah. And so uh, I was able to get involved with the group in cardiology, and we were able to get a lot of things going, a lot of research and conferences and so forth, mm -hmm. looking at exercise and uh, cardiovascular disease uh, prevention, rehabilitation as well. Mm -hmm. Did you have, uh, were you getting a lot of uh, graduate students at that time too? Uh, 
working with you? Or did, did you have a PhD program then? Yes, at, at Berkeley we had an EDD program, I, okay. and so uh, I had one graduate student there, uh, uh, Dr. Bob Girandola, that's at USC, University of Southern California, and then at the University of California, Davis, uh, Jim Davis, uh, who's now at Long Beach uh, University or Cal State, California State University at Long Beach, uh, was my doctoral student there. Mm -hmm. Uh, interestingly, along came an opportunity to uh, go to Los Angeles for a year and work with Bob Curlin and Frank Job, two outstanding orthopedic surgeons in the Los Angeles area that were the team physicians for the Lakers and the mm. Rams and the Dodgers and the Kings and, wow. and even the Angels and even uh, some of the teams outside they were doing a lot of consulting for. And so they asked me to come down just for a year to set up a, an institute that would uh, emphasize not only the application of physiology to sport through the professional athletes and also through the many people that they had coming through the Curl and Job Clinic, uh, but also to the general population. And that was just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity mm -hmm. to work with two outstanding uh, uh, physicians, orthopedic surgeons, and uh, to get an opportunity to work with the level of athlete that we had at that time. Oh, yeah. And it was yeah. exciting. When was that? Uh, that was uh, in uh, 19, I have to think about this now, yeah. that was probably about 1975, 76. Okay. So after that year, I was on my way back to Davis and uh, the people at the University of Arizona called and said, we'd really like you to consider coming over and helping us combine our men's and women's uh, departments of physical education into one department. Mm -hmm. uh, we had no intention of leaving California. That was, both my wife and I were born and raised there and that, those, that was where our roots were, our families and everything. Mm -hmm. But we said, well, we'll come over and take a look and uh, came over and I thought it, it had tremendous potential. They had a medical school on campus. This was Tucson? This was in Tucson. And uh, I brought my family over and we had, at that time, just our oldest two daughters and my wife and everybody had a black ball and if nobody wanted to come, we wouldn't go. But Everybody fell in love with Tucson, mm, so that's nice. we ended up there a, a number of years and uh, had uh, a number of doctoral students. In fact, uh, uh, th two of them uh, have just recently, uh, one at this meeting is receiving a citation award, Dr. Ed Coyle, and then Dr. Peter Farrell received a citation award two years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. Mike Joyner, who yeah, will eventually be an honor award winner, yeah. and, and likewise with Dr. Farrell and Dr. Coyle. Those were all three of my students there wow. at the same time. And, That's uh, quite a lineup. Well, it was intimidating <laughs> to me because uh, they were so bright. And I'm certainly not bright, I just, I, I'm a plugger. And uh, to try to stay ahead of them was a, a real <laughs> challenge. Yeah. In fact, I'd come in in the mornings early uh, and they'd already be in the lab and they'd be doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And since we're on, you know, being filmed, <laughs> I won't go into detail, <laughs> but I'd say, you guys are gonna get me fired. Uh -huh. and. Uh, uh -huh. They would have uh, midnight requisition of equipment, uh, and they just say, "Don't ask questions." <laughs> no. We have this now, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it was really a joy working with them, and uh, in, in fact, I have to say, uh, of everything I've done professionally, my interaction with students have been the most rewarding, yeah. and I, I still have a deep love for them. They're like family, and mm -hmm. we still have them at our house, uh, and we see them as often as we can, and stay in communication yeah, that's with nice. them. Well, back to ACSM, because all, all those names you mentioned yes. have been integral or integral parts of ACSM, not only winning awards, but presenting papers. And, and, I, and I know some of their students are now involved. And, That's right. Um, was that just something that uh, happened, or did you sort of encourage them towards ACSM? or? How right right from the very beginning with our students, we wanted to get them professionally involved. Mm -hmm. We said that's important. At that time, the word networking hadn't even been uh, developed in right. its current context. Yeah. And uh, it was delightful to see how responsive they were. We, we did actually a number of things to try to encourage our students. We were able to, always able to get some money to bring people to campus. And the idea for that was, was multi-fold, but, but we wanted our students to have intimate interactions with the students. Like at Arizona, when we first went over there, we would have uh, people like Reggie Edgerton and Ken Baldwin mm -hmm. and, you know, George Brooks. We'd have people come in and uh, give seminars and then spend time with students mm -hmm. and uh, 
really have some close interaction. Uh, we had John Hollisey. We had uh, Norman Jones from Canada. We had just as whoever we could get, we would we would bring in mm -hmm. to show those people the the experts coming in, the quality of the students that we had, and the opportunities at the University of Arizona, mm -hmm. and likewise to expose our students to really... That was a win-win situation. Oh, it was ab it? absolutely incredible. Perfect. And so when they would go to, to the national ACSM meetings and the regional, they would immediately know these people, mm -hmm. they would have uh, the ability to interact with them, and they became more colleagues rather than students yeah. for the first time being in awe of mm -hmm. somebody they just, you know, idolize because of their research and, mm -hmm. and things they've done. Yeah. And this turned into uh, uh, many of our students doing postdocs with these people, and uh, even a lot of our master's students uh, went on and worked in research labs. Uh, John Hollisey had, I think, at least three or four of our master's students that went and worked in his lab uh, at, at one he, time he or at uh, Washington then? Washington University yeah. uh, School of Medicine. Yeah. So that worked out extremely well, but the whole focus was trying to get them to present their research at the annual meetings of the American College of Sports Medicine mm -hmm. to get further exposure to all of these different people. And each of us would try to take our students around and, and introduce them to as many uh, other faculty members and, and clinicians and so forth mm -hmm. so that they would really know who the people were in the college. Mm -hmm. As a result, these people have, and themselves have gotten very involved oh, uh, yeah. in the college. Yeah, what a years. great idea. I don't have my uh, list with me, but uh, around the time you became president of ACSM, and uh, can you recall sort of oh, what, yes. was, what was going on? That was an, <laughs> in, an interesting time. There was, a, there was a tremendous transition there. At that time, we were uh, basically a group of about five or six people were reviewing all of the submissions oh. of abstracts. For the uh, for for everything for oh, every wow. area, and uh, I was deeply committed uh, after our last experience that we had that we needed to to divide the abstracts up into sections, and then have expert reviewers in each of the sections mm -hmm. because I said, you know, I thought. It's very unfair to these people. For example, let's say the area of perceived exertion. Mm -hmm. There was nobody reviewing abstracts that had any familiarity or expertise in that area. So they were inclined to say, well, nobody's going to be interested in that <laughs> right. and toss it. And I said, this isn't right. You know, yeah. this isn't fair. Yeah. So this was, uh, it was great because the board went along with it. We were able to set up, I believe at that time, maybe 12 sections in which abstracts would be submitted. And then we would get at least three or four reviewers for each of those sections so that each abstract was being reviewed by at least two or three people that were highly qualified in that area, mm -hmm. or at least reasonably qualified to be yeah. able to, to give an expert a, uh, opinion as to whether it was you know, worthwhile to be presented at the annual meeting. Mm -hmm. that, that, of course, has changed now where anybody that is uh, in a fellow status can come on board and, and you know, have their abstracts accepted and everything. Uh, there's not that critical review process that uh, mm -hmm. used to go on. But uh, that was very time consuming. It was interesting because the year that I was uh, president-elect and setting up the program for that year, all the rejected abstracts, I sat down with my typewriter and wrote letters to each of the people and gave them feedback because we'd asked each of the reviewers to write a brief commentary on why it was rejected. Mm -hmm. We felt it was important that people had had abstracts yeah. rejected get yeah. some feedback as to why mm -hmm. so it wouldn't discourage them from you know, trying again uh, at some time in the future. Mm -hmm. So th that, was, uh, that was a lot of fun, but obviously that would be impossible to, <laughs> right. to do today. That right. was when the college was... I believe uh, around 2,000 people at that time. Mm -hmm. As compared to 18 now or 20 or I whatever know. it's at It's now. incredible. But it, it, was, it was an exciting time of change. That was about the time we were beginning to look at relocating the college from Madison. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a strong push towards Kansas City, and we were very close to making that decision yeah. when Indianapolis sort of popped up. And it was really uh, an exciting time to see that transition and that possibility and to just realize how much the college had grown in such a short period mm -hmm. of time mm -hmm. where they were actually looking at a national office. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd had a national office, but it was sort of a backroom operation uh, that was sort in of the in, the, in the bowels right. of the stadium yeah. at the University of right. Wisconsin. 
All right. Yeah, and it was nice, too, that uh, Indianapolis really stepped up and clearly wanted the they college. Did. And actually, in uh, fairness to Kansas City, Kansas City was extremely good. And we had a number of meetings where we flew in there and met with the civic leaders and uh, looked at property and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they, they were just uh, outstanding. But I think the thing that drew us to Indianapolis was the fact that they were then attracting so many different sporting groups. Oh, yeah. uh, the governing bodies of various sports right. were relocating there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it turned out that the NC2A that was in Kansas City ended up relocating yeah. to Indianapolis yeah. as well. So mm -hmm. they did a very good job of presenting uh, a very logical, comprehensive uh, plan that mm -hmm. made a lot of sense to move the college there. Was HUD not the mayor then? I believe so. I believe so, but I wouldn't want to be yeah. held to that. Well, I, I was <laughs> thinking that you maybe had some meetings with the mayor's office or something, you know, when you were Actually, negotiating by, that. by the thing. time I got to the decision on Indianapolis, uh, I was uh, uh, probably uh, maybe a, a year past the past president. I think so. Haskell was, uh, I didn't ask him this today, but I think Haskell was right involved in that. Right. That could, I, that I could I well be. I remember him at the ribbon cutting and so forth of the... National Center. Well, and, and interestingly, even though they were working sort of out of the bowels of the stadium, uh, we had such an exceptional staff with uh, uh, Carol uh, being sort of the the point person, and I, I'm just blanking on Carol's last name right now. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> it's old age on my, my part. Uh, but uh, she just had a love and a heart for uh, the college and she mm -hmm. just did so much above and beyond the call of duty and then Tom Miller yeah. came in to be the executive director and the thing I loved about Tom he was always in the background he was he was making you know he was doing all all that had to be done to make the big decisions but it was all he was never visibly involved in the big decisions mm -hmm. And I was, I really respected him when I think it was after his fifth or sixth year, somewhere in there, he said, you know, it's healthy for college at your point in development to have a rotation of, of leadership at my level. And he says, I'm gonna turn in my resignation. Uh, I love you guys and I would love to stay, but I think it's in your best interest if you get somebody else in here that can take it up to the next level. And I always respected him for yeah, that. That's he was a good friend, a great leader, and j just was at the right place at the right time for the college and its, its growth at that time. Mm -hmm. um, could you comment a little bit on um, sort of the, the growth of exercise physiology as a field? I mean, you look at these <laughs> textbooks now and they're, they're this thick. <laughs> uh, the one I had when I was an undergrad was that yeah. thick. Was it Karpovich? <laughs> uh, actually, it was Karpovich. Yeah. I and then, then I had DeVries. Yes. I've got both that, of those original editions yeah. I keep in my library just for yeah. that. It, it's been exciting to see the growth in the field. And uh, in all honesty, I think a large percentage of the early exercise physiologists all came out of physical education mm, backgrounds. I Most of the so. graduate training was coming out of physical education yeah. departments. And it turns out that a lot of people that were trained in biology and, and maybe even cellular uh, biology and later on even into genetics and so forth were coming into PE departments to do their work. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden PE departments have sort of changed shape, possibly becoming kinesiology. That was sort of the, the push at one time when Eanes Produce and, and Rainer Martins and so forth and many others were pushing to get a common name so that we wouldn't have 80 different names for yeah. for this field of study. Mm -hmm. Now it included more than exercise physiology, I was, it was biomechanics. And I experienced it firsthand at Washington. And that was a most unfortunate situation. <laughs> was. That was, we don't need to go into that. No, but, no that was that but, was yeah. exceptional uh, program. What, yeah. a, what an accumulation of talent in one program. Yeah, that was pretty exciting. But, but it's really just mushroomed. And I think it's been rewarding to see people that would not even consider exercise as a potential modality to be involved at all in this either rehab or prevention. Mm -hmm. Some of these people that were so resistant are now leading the, the pack. I mean, we convinced them, got them sold on it. The mm -hmm. medical community has sort of bought in yeah. 
uh, at least a, a, a large significant part of them. Mm -hmm. And that has just really helped the field mushroom. We're beginning to really understand and tease out the direct effects of uh, exercise and physical activity mm -hmm. and disease prevention and rehabilitation. How, um, ask it in a more positive way. Yeah. Uh, I, anyway, I think back of um, Cooper and, and aerobics, you yes. know, as a bestseller, uh, 1968. Um, did, did, did that have a big impact at the time or did it take a while for, for that to catch on? I mean, because things had been going on like that. Correct. But, but, but all of a sudden here's, it's packaged in a little different way and it's in a, paperback and it's in the New York Times bestseller and did, did that give the whole field a, a positive boost? I think two people that I, I saw in my early development that really had a major impact in the field were, were, uh, and those two would be Dr. Perol of Ostrom, mm -hmm. who's sort of like a you know just I'm going to talk to him later and I an idol uh, and that's I don't like to use the word idol but I mean I just he really was a encouragement to me not only as a young professor encouraging me but but just being there leading the field mm -hmm. in this area and he was in the early aspects of the health related uh, you know effects of exercise uh, mm -hmm. in terms of prevention and rehabilitation and the other one was Ken Cooper mm -hmm. and uh, I had an opportunity to meet Dr. Cooper at a, at a very early point in my life in fact uh, at one time uh, was considering going and, and to, wor to work with him at the uh, Institute for Aerobics Research right as it was getting started. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people say he was just in the right place at the right time and you know it's, it's sort of like it was unfair that he get all the publicity. Mm -hmm. He turned it around. I, I really feel That's that... That's what I was wondering. I, uh, I, I give him a lot of credit for <laughs> the success that we have enjoyed over the years. Mm -hmm. I know many people will would not like to say that, but I don't see how they can deny the impact of that book yeah. in getting the public recognition. Mm -hmm. You know, we were essentially a small group of people talking to ourselves, and all of a sudden we're a small t group, of, group of people talking to the masses. Yeah. Yeah. And he opened up that opportunity. Mm -hmm. People were suddenly saying, wow, there's something to this. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I think he brought a level of credibility to this, and I think it's unfair that a lot of people have taken pot shots at him over the years, being sort of an opportunist and so forth. I don't believe that at all. Mm -hmm. I believe that uh, that Ken, with his uh, uh, his determination and his tenacity and so forth, was able to come overcome a lot of odds to do what he did, and mm -hmm. I give him full credit for that. And, and having the MD degree, I think, behind his name, yes, added something to that as well. And not only that, he was very respectful of those that had PhD de de degrees, in fact, hired a number of them. Yes. And look at the success of right. the institute that right. he has now that Dr. Stephen Blair has yeah. taken just to uh, great heights. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, th I, th I think Ken deserves a great deal of credit. Yeah, okay. Thank you for <laughs> I always wondered that, but um, yeah. we're almost, we're running out of time here. Okay. But I wanted to go back to the exercise physiology thing again and ask if you would comment, I know your book, and so there's, there's several out there now, but I don't remember what happened between DeVries and Karpovich. And in other words, in these, what, what were the, the books between there and, and yours? Were, were there any, I, or were there just addition, different editions? I, I'm drawing a blank on that. That's, a, that's a good question. I, I have tried to keep all of the books, and it, it sort of goes to DeVries Karp, or, uh, Karpovich, and then DeVries came along, mm -hmm. and then I think the very first book that I did with Alan and Bacon was maybe one of the, the next ones that okay. came along. Would that have been in the 70s? Or that, when would that would have been, been? Uh, probably early 70s, yes. Okay. Yes, it mm -hmm. was uh, when I was at the Univ University of California, okay. Davis, when okay. I started that. and. Uh, Basically, that was more of a sport physiology book, but over time, we changed that uh, so that it basically uh, focused on sport and exercise physiology. Mm -hmm. Our, our uh, strategy for using that approach was that you can usually capture the attention of people with sport. Mm -hmm. And if you can use sport as illustrations, uh, you have a, a pretty good captive audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was our purpose, just not to, you know, to make 
make it somewhat more fun and enjoyable and to sort of hook the interest of the students uh, on the basis of their interest in sport. Mm -hmm. And then um, what, uh, uh, what, went, what came next? You've done many textbooks since then. Right, well, I, uh, I recruited Dr. Costell, Dave Costell, to come in and join me uh, as the book got more comprehensive because I, I was very limited in my knowledge in, in actually quite a few areas, but, <laughs> but uh, he was a great uh, addition, and now we have Dr. Larry Kenny joining us. And the idea being we're always trying to get people involved that have a good basic science background that are doing research in the basic science, but also a good applied mm -hmm. science background mm -hmm. that know the application. I think mm -hmm. uh, as far as a textbook, you've got to be able to write it in a way that it's uh, applicable to the students. And uh, Dave is, it was, been, it was really great at that, and Larry is exceptional, and mm -hmm. that's been good. And I think uh, there's just really a, a lot of good books on the market right now. Uh, Dr. Powers and Howley have done an exceptionally good job with their book, and of course, uh, Drs. McArdle, Catch and Catch, Catch have really yeah. good book. And yeah. Dr. Robergs, Robergs and uh, Cotillion have done a great job. So just shows you, though, what's out there. I mean, the is. literature to be able to, I mean, these books are getting thicker yes. and thicker and thicker. Interestingly, and our goal is to cut our book down considerably. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Maybe too much for, uh, is, are they undergrad texts or both? Or They're what? undergrad. And I think the, 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 the mistake that's made is that sometimes people try to, to reach both audiences. And in the process, I think you make it too technical for the undergraduate mm -hmm. student. I owe a lot to Dr. Reiner Martins for helping me understand how to write to the level of the student, and he always talks about a road map, taking them from point A to B to C mm -hmm, and so forth, mm -hmm. and did a really good job of helping us understand that, uh, to make it uh, more appealing to the student and to help guide them through this pathway, mm -hmm. try to take them through material that goes from simple to complex and, and so on. Do, they, uh, do you have a lab manual with it? or? Uh how no, does that work? we elected not to do no. that, and unfortunately today there are very few universities where they actually have oh, no. laboratory experiences. Okay. It's become so prohibitively expensive yeah, to do that. To get the hands on. It has yeah. been, and then we try to do that in, in some other ways by showing videos of different testing techniques and everything. And it's unfortunate because the direct hands-on approach is really helpful. Yeah. Um, just sort of in, in concluding okay. here, um, you've been involved in ACSM a long time. Uh, any thoughts on sort of where ACSM is now and where they may be headed in the future? And, um, I guess my only comment would be I, I would hope that ACSM never loses sight of the fact that it's a college. Mm -hmm. And that has certain connotations as far as what its focus should be. And I would hope we don't try to create another uh, American Alliance for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not slamming that. That's a very valuable organization. But it became so diffuse that it lost a focus. Mm -hmm. And I think that the same is true with the American College of Sports Medicine. We don't want to be so inclusive that we lose the focus of the fact that we are a college mm -hmm. and not just an association, Good loose point. association yeah. of, uh, you know, people that sort of like to hang out, exercise, do sport, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, well, thank you. We're good. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Nice I appreciate having by. the opportunity.